Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. Uh, the Armor of God intro. Okay, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. And we're going to read through this. Um, there's two main points I want to do in this intro. To, so we go through this whole study that you keep these two things in mind as we go through these studies and start going through each piece of the armor of God. Okay? But first I want to read through Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Notice we see there, in the Lord. Uh, time and time again, you're supposed to be created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Okay? Time and time we see it again, in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus. We're supposed to be in Christ Jesus. It says here, finally, my brethren, be strong. And where's that strength? In the Lord. Remember what the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Through Christ. Okay. Once again, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. 11. Here's the command. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That's the first thing we're going to be talking about here in a second. Is You're not supposed to just put on a part of the armor of God or a piece of the armor of God. You're supposed to put on the whole armor of God. As we go through the pieces of armor of God, you're going to realize how they connect with one another. Right? You need all the armor of God on in order to stand. What does it say there? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The whole armor of God. If you don't have the whole armor of God on, you can't stand against the wiles of the devil. Right? How many times have we fallen flat on our face, brothers and sisters in Christ, because we didn't have the whole armor of God on? Something that we're going to learn that you're supposed to put on every morning. You need to make sure that whole armor of God's on. Right. Verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. As we get through this, these studies, you're going to learn that the two things you're going to be warring against is uh, Satan evil spirits, the lost world, they belong, if you're, if, they're, if you're lost and you're watching this, you belong to Satan. He can use you as he sees fit. Okay? That's why the Bible talks about the lost being the enemy, and you love your enemy by preaching the gospel to him. We're going to get to the feet shod with the preparation of peace. But the two things you're going to be warring with in your life as a Christian is the flesh, and evil spirits, wickedness, lost the lost world. Those are the two biggest things you're going to be fighting. Okay? Again, spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, Satan loves to see you lose your testimony. He loves to see you fall. He loves to see God have to punish his own children. Chastisement. Okay? He can't prevent people. Remember we used to talk about uh, if he can't prevent people from getting saved... That's the number one job of these false converts is to prevent people from getting saved. And if they can't prevent you from getting saved, because ultimately it's your choice. They can't. They can really motivate you in the wrong direction, but it's your choice. And there's people who will still get saved. So if you, if you get saved and they weren't able to prevent you from getting saved, what do they do? They try to mess you up with sin. They get you to get, they try to mess up your walk with the Lord. Okay? So these are the two things you're going to be wrestling with. You're going to be wrestling with the temptations of the flesh, of the world, and you're going to be wrestling with uh, the wickedness of the world. Okay. Verse 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. There it says it again, twice. That ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Now if we go back... How many times did it mention stand? It mentioned stand in verse 11 once, and in verse 13 it mentions it twice. Done all to stand. When the Bible repeats itself several times, it's something that's important. Now, don't get me wrong, every word of God is important, but it's really pushing this thing that if you don't put on the whole armor of God, you won't be able to stand. Verse 14. Stand, there you see the word again. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, 
and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, true love for the lost world, your enemy, is to preach the gospel to them. Yeah. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith. Above all. Right? You need to have that shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Praying always, remember? We're supposed to pray without ceasing. Always praying in the Spirit. Uh, we talked about this in some other studies, Brothers of Christ, where it talks about God, why will God not hear certain prayers? One of my old sermons. Uh, because if you hold iniquity in your heart, God will not hear your prayers. There's times where God will ignore saved people if you're holding iniquity in your heart. And He will chastise you to get that iniquity out. Okay, you've got to throw that sin back on the foot of the cross. You know, repent, forsake, and get back to where you left off with Jesus Christ. But that's why it says right there again, it says, Pray supplication in the Spirit. Ultimately, when I did that study, it was to show how when someone comes to the cross broken, they're throwing their sins at the foot of the cross. They're no longer holding that sin in their heart. That's why God can hear somebody pray the prayer of salvation. It's not a specific prayer, but you confess your repentance and your belief in prayer to God. Um, and you ask Him to save you. How can He hear somebody like that? Because you threw your iniquity at the foot of the cross. Okay. It's an old uh, it's Proverbs or Psalms where King David says, you know, if I hold iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. But we see here, prayer, 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 prayer. You need to have a strong prayer life with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. If you ask me why I don't do prayers right here on the camera in front of everybody, I believe, honestly, you do your study. Got some bugs in here. If you do the study, the only time Jesus prayed in public is when he was given thanks for food. And then there's the uh, where he's teaching the Jews how to pray. And it has to do with the kingdom coming in. The kingdom of heaven. The physical kingdom. And Jesus is teaching him, saying this is how you should pray. But you're supposed to do it privately. Prayer is a one-on-one -on -one relationship between you and God. Okay? Why do we pray for food? Uh, I don't mean to go off on a whole other study, but um, to sanctify it. Okay. There was food that was considered unclean in the Old Testament, but today it's clean we, when we give prayer and give God thanks for it and ask God to bless it. Okay. So when he broke bread, he would pray in front of everybody. Okay. But prayer life is very important. You need to have a strong prayer life. Talk to God about anything and everything. Pray about everything. Okay. I realize that my spirit prayer life starts failing when I start falling into temptation and choosing to sin and the Bible gets put to the side, I stop talking to God as much, and what's realizing also for this study is the whole armor of God gets put up, gets hung up in the closet and it's just sitting there. You're forgetting to put on the whole armor of God. And the next thing you know, you fail. You lose that battle with the flesh. The battle with temptation, you lose uh, a testimony with the lost world. Right? You can be deceived as we get into this study. You can be deceived by the lost world. Okay? Paul talks about um, wolves in sheep's clothing, um, false converts. And if you have the whole armor of God on and you're not compromising, God will show them to you. Right? There's one right there. There's one right there. You might have to wait a little bit. You might have to be a little bit patient. You've got to be cautious. Have your guard up, have that shield. What does it say? Above all, put that take on that shield of faith. Or with you may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. But the times that I've been deceived by people is when I'm not putting on the whole armor of God. I'm not staying in prayer. I, you know, I start compromising. Okay? But supplication in the spirit, prayer and supplication in the spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Watching there too. Say a lot about that one. Okay? When you're watching and you're looking for Jesus Christ to come back any day, not the Antichrist to come back, not for the church to go into the time of Jacob's trouble, 
Jesus Christ could come, call us home any day. When you're doing that, you're keeping your eyes on your life as a Christian, and you're also keeping your eyes on the church, the body of Christ. We're to be there for one another, okay? to encourage one another, correct one another. Okay, watching there too with all perseverance. Keeping our eye out for Jesus Christ and looking out for one another. That's what I believe Paul's doing here to remind you, hey, do you have that whole armor of a God on? Did you forget to put a piece on? Make sure you have the whole armor on. Verse 19, And for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. That's what I've been trying to do, brothers and sisters of Christ. Um, verse 20, For which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Pray for courage. I pray for courage for you, brothers and sisters of Christ. I pray for courage for me that we speak boldly. There's a difference between being prideful and speaking boldly. Notice how he says, as I ought to speak. Boldly to make known the... Let's see if... I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Verse 20. Right. We're supposed to speak boldly. Why did Jesus stand out among the scribes, the Sadducees, and Pharisees? He spoke with one with authority and not as the scribes. Yea, hath God said, it could be this, it could be that, it's whatever you want it to be. We're supposed to be bold and we're supposed to speak boldly. Okay? But my warning for that is, is there's a difference between speaking boldly and being prideful. Okay? My prayer is that I don't get prideful. And I know there's times that I might or will, but I'm not justifying it. Okay? We want a prayer that we speak boldly, with confidence that God is opening the word of the scriptures to us, that we can speak it to the brethren. Okay? Whether it's through fellowship, whether God calls a man into ministry. Okay. But getting back to the armor of God, first thing I want to talk about for this the intro as we go through all the pieces is remember what I already emphasized on, putting on the whole armor of God. Now real quick, how many pieces of armor of God did we read? Your first thought would be six, right? Six pieces of the armor of God. Actually, there's seven. Okay. Let's go through them again. You have loins girt about with truth. Okay. Uh, a lot of people like to say we're going to get into that one uh, for the first. We're just going to go in order as how it was read here. But some people say it's a belt. It's a belt. Well, I've been doing some study on it, and it's more than just a belt. Okay. When you gird up your loins with truth, uh, you're girding up your loins so you can hook the sword of truth. You know, the sword of the spirit which is the Word of God. Without girding up your loins, you're not able to put that sword on there. Okay. Uh, but you have that. Uh, breastplate of righteousness. There's two. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And we got three. Shield of faith. There's four. Remember what it talks about not being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine? That's why you have a shield of faith. You're not like a fish out of water just flopping side to side. Oh, this sounds good today, but tomorrow that might sound good. Or this might. And you just... Oops. <laughs> but uh, that's four. Shield of faith. Five. The helmet of salvation. People say, and then the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And you say, well, that's only six, right? You have you. The saved sinner with the Holy Spirit in you. Okay. Romans 8 9 says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Capital S, Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You have the Word of God, and you have uh, the Spirit. I'm sorry for that. I should have turned it off, but... The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what brings us into all truth. You get into John 16, 13, it says, Howbeit when he, the Spirit, capital S, Spirit of Truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, 
For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. What the Holy Spirit hears from God the Father, that's what he speaks. Okay? You need to have the Holy Spirit. You need you. Okay? You, the saved sinner with the Holy Spirit in him, is the seventh piece of armor. Okay? And we'll be talking about that. You need to have the Holy Spirit in you. You'll have a lot of people that like to put up, um, what do you call it, uh, counterfeit. They like to counterfeit things. Uh, I'll try to show a picture of this, but I have a coin here that's supposed to be the Armor of God coin. And what they put on here is a Roman soldier. And I just, just when I've done my study, it didn't take long, I was like, this is satanic, having a Roman soldier. Okay, oh, it's not that big of a... Yes, it is. Because I was in the military. You had different suits of armor for different suits of people. That's how you determine what nation was who and who was on whose side. When you went into war, you look at how people are dressed. Then you look at how they act. Then you look at how they speak. I mean, there's a little bit more to it. But those who have known, it's like, you see a Roman soldier, that's a Roman soldier. It's not a, not a, it's not a soldier for Jesus Christ. It's a Roman soldier. And they always show that. There's counterfeit. People love to counterfeit. So how do you determine if someone's real or not? By the Holy Ghost. Through the written word of God, the Holy Ghost is in you and he points people out and says, Hey, look at that. Wait for it. Check that out. Okay, look at that. See what's going over? Did you hear what that person just said? What does my word say? You know, he shows you things. But I got this coin. I found it, you know. It says, Helmet of Salvation, Breastplate of Righteousness, Sword of the Spirit, Shield of Faith, Loins Girt About with Truth, and Feet Gospel of Peace. It says the whole armor of God. And then he read, reads back through basically what we read through on the back. Okay? But it leaves out the, a very important part. The Holy, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the saved sinner. A lost person can try to counterfeit and pretend like they have the full armor of God on, but they will, you should be able to see right through them. You need to have the Holy Spirit. He'll guide you into all truth. So the first thing that we're going to be emphasizing as we do this study, brothers and sisters Christ, is that you put on the whole armor of God. When you put on the whole armor of God, remember we talked about in the study about the Lord is King, making soldiers, okay? A man's foes shall be they of his own household. God did, uh, he, Jesus did not come to bring peace, but a sword. This right here. A sword. And he's going to open, as he opens the scriptures to you, and you start to have that changed life, because I'm going to go into this again, like we talked about in the other study. Um, I was military. When I came out of basic training, I wasn't the same man that went in. That's what just, I mean, you're supposed to be a Bible-believing, God-fearing man and woman, and you don't believe in repentance as it applies to salvation, and you don't believe in a changed life after salvation, but you're going to be a good soldier for Jesus Christ. Well, when you put on the whole armor of God, and you've been through basic training, God puts you through some experiences and helps clean up your life and get you all acting like a Christian, looking like a Christian, speaking like a Christian, you're going to be, have a changed life. Uh, you talk differently. When I got back from the military, I couldn't help it. I was calling everyone sir and every, every guy sir and every woman ma'am. I was calling my mom and my grandma ma'am and my uncle and my grandfather. I was saying sir. I even called my brother sir. <laughs> and he got on to me and said, that's right, you call me sir. I'm being funny, but the thing is, is you, you speak differently. Your language changes. How you walk. They said my demeanor. I used to hunch. But when I got back from basic training and all that marching and, and training, I, I walked different. I carried myself differently. So I walked differently. I spoke differently. Okay. I had to change life. Okay? When you get saved and you put on the whole armor of God, there's going to be a changed life. Okay? You have to put on the whole armor of God. Now, the second part that's very important about these studies that we're going to be doing also is, is we talked about this in other studies when it comes to about, people don't like these words, but what is it? Prove, approve, and reprove. Okay, you're supposed to prove yourself. 
You're supposed to be approved by the brethren, and when you fail both of those, you get reproved by the brethren. Okay? But the bit, most important part about the whole armor of God is you're supposed to prove that armor. You prove yourself, you get approved by the brethren, but an armor gets proved. What does that mean? You train in it. You get to where it's meant for you. That breastplate of righteousness is meant for you. That helmet of salvation, that shield of faith, that sword, you know how to use them. They're, it's built for you. It's like God gives every person their own specific su uh, suit of armor of God. And it fits that person. Okay. You're supposed to prove it. Okay. Turn to 1 Samuel 17, 1 through 10. We're going to read 1 Samuel. Next thing for this is you've got to prove these pieces of armor. Now you've got to prove yourself. Even with that last piece of armor that you've got the Holy Spirit in you, you've got to prove yourselves whether you be in the faith. You've got to prove it. And you've got to be approved. Uh, 1 Samuel 17, 1 through 10. I remember Paul, when Paul was supposed to go hang out with the, the apostles and the early Christians when he first got saved, they're like, you don't bring him in here, he's killing Christians. Someone had to come in and say, I've seen him, he's proven himself to me and I'm here to approve him. I've seen him. Okay. He's been preaching the word of God in the streets. He's been preaching Jesus Christ, the mystery of the gospel. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. That simple. And it leads to a changed life. Putting on the whole armor of God. 1 Samuel 17, 1 through 10. Now, the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shok... I'm bad with the names, but... Shokoth, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shokoth and Ezekah, and I can't pronounce that. Ephes, Damon, 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 Mem, Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on, the, on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Now, I wish it was that simple. Enemies over here... <laughs> Uh, brothers and sisters of Christ over here, the army of the Lord here, the army of Satan over here. I wish it was always that easy. But as we walk through this world, it seems that it's all intermixed. And you need to have the whole armor of God on. And you need to have the Holy Spirit. And you need to keep hiding God's word in your heart that God can open your eyes to people. Okay, this one's true. They might be struggling with some sin, but they're saved. This one over here, they're not saved. They're a wolf in sheep's clothing. You know, so on and so forth. I just wish it was so simple as... That's that side and this side. I think it was Peter Ruckman said he's got his enemies over here and he's got his friends over here. Completely separate. No in between. All right. But you see here you got Goliath of Gath whose height was six cubits in a span. So you got a guy standing up there that's very scary. Very huge, very tall, very scary. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head. So he had his own armor. And was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear had weight, sit, weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. See how I talked about how they have counterfeit armor? They have their armor. And then we're supposed to have the armor of God that we read. Verse 8, And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man from you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. 
But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. In verse, in verse 10. And the Philistines said, I defy, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. You have a lot of people that will attack the true plan of salvation. Okay? They'll attack the King James Bible as God's perfect written word. They'll attack the Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. Jesus Christ has a zero tolerance for sin. He hates sin, and he gets angry when people sin. Okay? That's why there's chastisement. He gets chastised as a father would a, ch a child. Okay? That shows that he loves us. Mm -hmm. But he has zero tolerance for sin. But people who attack the real Jesus Christ of the King James Bible, the true plan of salvation of the King James Bible that leads to a changed life, the King James Bible being God's perfect written word of English, what are they doing? They're defying the armies, the uh, armies of Israel today. Okay, the armies of the living God. There, some people are just so blatant; they don't try to hide it. That's what's going on here. So I had to read this one first to show you have someone who's very scary, very tall, huge, like a giant, and he's got his own armor on that looks probably really scary. He's got his weapons and everything. So what happens next? Uh, jump down to verse 20. Oops, went too far. This is my big lettering, so sometimes you have to turn multiple pages. But First Samuel 17, 20, 24. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. You notice how it's the different reaction to when you have the whole armor of God on, and you have someone who died, who's probably failed to put the whole armor of God in, or someone who's lost. I was a false convert most of my life. How they react to things. You know, you hear something, you go, wait a second, that's not right. What that person's saying right there is not right. King David just, well, he's not king yet, but David, uh, he heard that. With said, Look what he says. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. Okay. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up surely to defy Israel as he come up? And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him the daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and take away the reproach from Israel? For who is that... Th for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? That's what I was looking for, his response. Who is this man to defy us? Okay. You sure hear somebody, and remember we said how we're supposed to, that we might be speak boldly. You have the whole armor of God on, and you're able to speak boldly as you ought to speak. Who is this guy trying to defy the, the, the army of the living God? All right. Jump down to 37, because we're going to get to this. Proving the armor. We're going to see that Saul tries to throw all his armor on King David. And King David's like, I can't do this. It's, it's not proven. This armor, armor is just not proven. First Samuel 17.37 We're going to read to 40. David said, "Moreover, thus, Lord, is that the right one? Yeah. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor, 
and he put on the helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. In other words, he's checking out, trying to move around, trying to walk around. Okay. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And he took his staff, that was proven, in his hand, and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, and put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. He took what was proven. That's why when we talk, brother and sister Christ, we're not trying to be mean, but when someone's newly saved, and they're young, you don't just jump in ministry right away. Okay, you got to prove that armor. You got to get that armor on. You got to go, go through some training and th go through some experiences. I've learned my advice to newly saved men and women, um, brothers and sisters in Christ that are looking young women, men and women. They're looking that they want to have a husband or a wife someday. Make sure that you have to get your armor proven first. You got to start working. Let God work on your life first and get your life cleaned up to a point. And get your walk with the Lord going strong before you're even ready for marriage. All right. So there's these different things you can apply this to. But ultimately, when we go through this, uh, the whole armor of God, remember, you've got to prove it. It takes training to, to learn how to use it. It takes training, making mistakes, sometimes falling flat on your face. Right? When you get the helmet of salvation, uh, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I'm talking about salvation in this life. You get a headshot, you're out. <laughs> you're out for the count. Okay. Um, so as we read through here, you got to prove the armor. So something doesn't get taught that much, okay? We get told what the armor of God is, but we, didn't, we don't get told that, hey, you need to have the whole armor of God on. Every piece. Okay? And then we hardly get taught that you need to prove it. That armor needs to be proven. Okay? You can always tell people that are newly saved, I'm a big example, that... They haven't proven that sword of, of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And they, I put my foot in my mouth when I was newly saved because I, I wanted to act like, I want to be like everybody else. And I know what everybody's talking about the Word of God, these men, elderly men that have been in the faith for a while. And I just want to contribute. And, and, and I just start throwing stuff here and there and taking verses out of context and, and stuff like that. And I put my foot in my mouth a lot because I hadn't proven it. I didn't train up. The Bible says, study that I was trying, but I wasn't there yet. And I'm still not 100% there, but the Bible talks about study to show that self approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15, I think, is the one. But you can put your foot in your mouth because it's not proven. Mm -hmm. uh, preaching the gospel, the feet shod with the preparation of peace. Like I told you, the first time, in uh, some of these other studies, I always tell you, when I first... I would just lay gospel places. I didn't really have the courage to confront people because people would sometimes people would try to get into a debate. They try to get into an argument. They try to pull me away from the true plan of salvation. And I would start out with just laying gospel tracts places. And over time, like we read there, I speak boldly as I ought to speak. I started getting God gave me courage. I know the plan of salvation. I got saved off of this. I have courage now, and I'm able to hand the gospel tracts to people at the beach, uh, when I'm out and about, uh, talk to people online uh, about the Word of God. There's a thing where it's supposed to be proven. Now, like we mentioned, because I put it in my notes, like we mentioned when we read about, um, you could see the armory, armor that um, Goliath was wearing. And the armies were set at array. There's difference in the armor that the Philistines were wearing, and there's a difference in the armor that uh, the Jewish people were wearing. Israel. Okay. But you'll see that a lot of times there's going to be a lot of counterfeit armor out there trying to claim that this is the armor of God, and they're not wearing the armor of God. They're putting on Saul's armor. Remember that study we did about King Saul? I am obeying the word of the Lord. But Saul was about himself. Saul is about pleasing the world, pleasing men. Okay? 
as we saw, David's like, I can't wear this armor. Right? i got to wear the armor that God gave me. And we read through it. He's got a sling. He's got a satchel. He's got a staff. Right? Things that God gave him that's been proven. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. We read, this is where I quoted earlier, but this is where it comes from. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. Okay? He talks about, as, have us as an example. When he talks about, Paul's talking about us, Timothy, the men that Paul would train up and send, okay, you go to this church, confirm the churches, help them out there. You go over here, okay, that you know that we, we've proven ourselves. Okay? We are not reprobates. Prove your own selves. Acts 8, 1. I wanted to go through this. I wanted to use Paul. We've already talked about Paul before, but I want to talk about him again. Turn to Acts 8, 1 about Paul proving himself. It wasn't something that, oh, he says he's a Christian? Then he's a Christian. Saul had, the, later became Paul, had to prove himself. Acts 8, 1. This is after they stoned Stephen, and Paul, uh, Saul was there. And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at, the, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul... He made havoc of the church, entering, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. And as we, if you read of Acts chapter 7, where Stephen's being stoned, Paul was even part of killing Christians. This is the man Paul was. This man walks up to you, oh, I'm a Christian now, wink, wink, let me in. You gonna let that guy in? No, you don't let that guy in. Turn to Acts 9. Acts 9, verses 1 and 2. And, and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughtering against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. Slaughterings. Once again, he's killing Christians. He's taking Christians into custody, throwing them in prison, and having them killed. Verse 2. And desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogue that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. So this man comes to you and says, Oh, I'm a Christian now. Wink, wink. What's the secret handshake, you know? The secret passphrase. No, he just said he's a Christian. Just let him in. Uh, no. Uh, Acts 9.19 This is after he met Jesus along the way. He's blind. Okay, He rose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. He wasn't on his own. He was with disciples that were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue that he is the Son of God. Verse 21. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on his, on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? There was a change. A changed life. How he spoke was different. How he carried himself was different. Isn't this the same man? 22. As he kept proving himself, proving the armor, you know, the whole armor of God. Verse 22. But Saul increased in the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. Proving yourselves. 
The armor of God has to be proven every day. You gotta train with it, you gotta make sure it fits, and you're wearing it every day. Nine twenty-six. Jump down to twenty-six. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. Yeah, you know, just some guy that was going around killing Christians, hauling them off into prisons, and was happy about it and approved of it, and now he's claiming to be a Christian, and believed not that he was a disciple. 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Okay. That's why it's important that the body of Christ, we're supposed to work together, and we're supposed to prove one another. Okay. It's not supposed to be a one-man show where you're out there and I'm just going to preach whatever I want to preach and do whatever I want to do and live however I want to live and who cares what anybody says. Uh, no, we're supposed to be held accountable one to another. And we're supposed to be approving ourselves one to another and being approved by one another. But we see here that uh, Barnabas comes to the rescue and says, you don't understand what I saw. This is, and testifies of who Paul is, or Saul that became Paul, who he is now. He's changed. He proved himself to Barnabas, and now Barnabas is approving him. Same thing goes with the whole armor of God. You gotta prove that armor every day. And you gotta be approved by the brethren. All right. And when we fail, like I forget to put on a piece of armor, and it's not proven, and I'm not approved, we get reproved, corrected. Hey, you forgot to put that armor of God on. Hey, you're falling into temptation. You're starting to do this sin over here. Uh, you're starting to fall for some, you know, false teachings. People that are attacking the King James Bible, trying to be Bible correctors, and so on and so forth. I can use as many examples as I can come across. But we see here that Paul proved himself and was approved by Barnabas. 29. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Grecians. He even fought for the Lord. You know? But they went about to slay him. His life was on the line. 2 Corinthians 11.23 2 Corinthians 11, 23. Remember the study we did on this, brother and sister Christ, when it comes to speaking as a fool. Okay, you answer a fool according to his folly, and there's a, a time where you don't answer a fool according to his folly. And one of the things we talked about was as speaking as a fool, and Paul set the best example. So I understand Paul normally wouldn't have said this at all, but he had to to make a point. Right, because he had to speak as they were speaking to get them to open their eyes. Um, but I'm reading through this again because as you read through this and you read through what Paul went through, did Paul prove himself? Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, you're going to go through some experiences in life. 2 Corinthians 11.23 Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, and labor is more abundance, and stripes above measures... Remember we just read about they were going about to kill him when he was preaching Jesus Christ boldly? And prisons more frequent and deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. There's a lot to that. One of these days I'd love to do a study on that saying, Hey, Paul might have died more than once. <laughs> but it shows that he was stoned once. But he spent a, a night and a day day in the deep. And journeys often in perils of waters, and perils of robbers, and right? perils by mine own countrymen. They were trying to kill him because he was standing for the word of God and preaching the proper plan of salvation, uh, trying to reveal the mystery of the gospel to people. It's not much of a mystery, 
But the Bible does talk about how it's, if the gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. In other words, they don't want to see it. They don't want to find the gospel. They're not looking for it. They don't want the change life gospel. People say, well, where, where does it say change life? It says that you should walk in newness of life. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. You were created in Christ Jesus on two good works. Okay. That's what happens when you get saved. God comes in and takes over and commands you. You put on the whole armor of God. You become a soldier for Jesus Christ. He commands you and tells you what to do, and you do it. That leads to a changed life. I've already talked about this in the other study. Uh, uh, the Lord is king, making soldiers, okay? You have a changed life when you become a soldier for Jesus Christ. Look what he's going through. Perils by my own countrymen, and perils by the heathen, and perils in the city, and perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren, and weariness and painfulness, and watchings often, and hunger and thirst, and fastings often, and cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Once again, he's proven himself. Now, you're not supposed to brag. This isn't Paul bragging. Why? Because he specifically says, I speak as a fool. I always try to warn some of the brethren that get out there. They try to make videos and they start doing mocking and everything. And they don't say, I speak as a fool. In other words, you're acting like and looking like the lost world. Paul didn't act and look like the lost world. He came out and flat out said, I speak as a fool. You guys want to hear, you guys think you, you, you're something? Well, I speak as a fool, and he goes through everything he's been through, which was, n which means that, which, if you go through the story, they went through nothing compared to what Paul went through. They had no room to speak. He did that to shut them up so they could listen, so Paul could reach them and start talking to them and teaching them some things. Okay. Now, could Paul have gone through all that he went through without the, having the whole armor of God on? Standing your ground, <laughs> not remember, stand, 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 don't faint, don't falter. Uh, when you come to an elder man in ministry, 10 years saved, 15 years saved, 20 years saved, who can testify to a lot of things that Paul went through, his armor is proven. The whole point I wanted to make with that is we need to be listening to the elder men in the church. Young men need to be listening to the elder men in the church that have been saved for a while, who've been through some experiences. They have some good testimonies to warn you so you don't make the same mistakes, to help you. Uh, the elder women are supposed to be teaching the younger women good things. How to be good keepers at home, how to love their husbands. And there's a list there. But the elder women have been through experience. How to raise children in the admission of the Lord. The elder women have been through some experiences. The younger women should be seeking you know, guidance from the elder women in the church. They've been through some experiences. Don't go, oh, I don't need him. Yeah, he's been saved for 60 years, and he's been through so much. I don't need to listen to him, though. I got this. I can do it on my own. Don't be, that's because where pride comes in. And that's where he was dealing with some of those people. And Paul just puts it right to him. This is what I've been through. Have you been through this? And you think you're something? Uh, think again. 1 Corinthians 11.31. Oh, sorry. 1 Corinthians. We're in a second. 1 Corinthians 11.31. I was like, why is it not lining up? First Corinthians 11.31 For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. When you're proving yourselves, sometimes you're going to fall flat on your face. And you have to judge yourself. Okay? Am I living right? Every day, I always talk about it. Your home is the place where you can be abstained from all appearance of evil. It's the only place that I know of for me where there, I can have, be abstained from all appearance of evil, where I can have true joy and true peace. 
setting out on my deck, living out on the mountainside. I know some people live in the in the city, but being in your home, it's supposed to be a safe place. I go to town and I try to walk on some of the beaches and there's vexation left and right. Going shopping, I just, I really don't like going into town that much anymore. It's just so vexing and when I have to, I have to. Um, I try to go walk on the beach. Uh, when winter hits on here, it rains a lot and I've got my winter outfit where I can get a little wet and my boots and I go walk on the beach and a lot of people don't want to be on the certain beaches. Uh, when it's really cold and it's rainy, but summertime it's hard for me to get out to the beach because there's just so much vexation about how women are dressed, how men are dressed. You know, for the women that are trying to, if there's any godly women trying to walk on the beach, and you know the language, the music that's blaring half the time, and it's just okay. judge yourselves. That's part of proving the, the armor when you have the word of God here. This is what you judge yourself by. Okay? This is how you live your life by. Do I have on the breastplate of righteousness? Am I living right in God's eyes? This is how you know if you're living right in God's eyes. Breastplate of righteousness. Okay? Remember, David could not put on Saul's armor. Saul was about, going back to about Saul, a lot of people like to put on Saul's armor because it looks cool. Hey, this armor looks cool. It means I get to be part of this club. You know, and it means I get to do whatever I want and everything. And Saul's armor, remember Saul, he was about pleasing the world. Right? I am obeying the word of God. I still remember that in the study. I am obeying the word of God. No, you're not. And Samuel had to put it to him. You're not obeying the word of the Lord. But you got people that love to wear Saul's armor. They don't want to put on the armor of God that God has given them. They want to put on someone else's armor that's not proven. But it's fun. You know, sin for a season. And my hair, I put on here too for the notes. It says, when I was false brethren, I was wearing Saul's armor. When I was a false brethren, oh yeah. I, I tried to put on this show that I said I was a Christian and, and everything. But was the armor proven? If someone was to ask me to prove that armor, I'd have fallen flat on my face. I was shown that that armor is not the armor of God, it's the armor of the world. It's just wickedness and sin. I look like the world, act like the world, laugh at the world's jokes. And when I say, is that armor proven, When because I profess to be saved, I wish somebody sooner would have come along and asked me to prove that you're a Christian. Prove that armor. And what, what, are you, what answer are you going to get today? Come on now. That's works-based salvation. Asking someone to prove themselves, that's works-based salvation. Whatever that is. So that term keeps changing in people's definitions. They say, well, no, no, no. If someone just says they're saved, you accept it. If someone says they're wearing the whole armor of God on, you just accept it. You take them at their word. No. You judge. Judgment must first begin at the house of God. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Let's jump back over to 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Yeah. Here we have it again. Okay. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you. Remember what we read about earlier. In Jesus Christ. You're created in Christ Jesus. How that Jesus Christ is in you except ye be reprobates, fakes, frauds. Oh, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. No, you're not. You're a counterfeit. But I trust that ye shall know that we are no reprobates. I'm reading through here because I want to make sure that I'm not going over the same thing again. But it just sounds familiar. But, but here we read it again. Prove yourselves. Romans 14, 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. You're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. 
You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. We read about the sword of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks. God the Father speak, tells the Holy Spirit what to tell us. Okay. What he hears, that he speaks. Verse 18, For he that is in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God, and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify one another. I'm hoping that this intro is going a lot longer than I wanted it to, but it's about edifying the body of Christ. Brother and sister Christ, when we go through and start talking about the armor of God, make sure that you're putting on the whole armor of God and how they are inter how they relate to one another and work hand in hand, and that you're proving them every day. You're staying in the Word. You're studying. You're sanctifying your life. You're hiding God's Word in your heart. Mm -hmm. The shield of, uh, shield of faith that you're continuing to stand for the faith. Mm -hmm. Now notice it says up here too, for it says, For in the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. It didn't say not righteousness or peace or joy. Okay, it says and. All three. The word is and. You'll see that. But righteousness and peace and joy, and what's it in? The Holy Ghost. People love the peace and joy, but hate the righteousness part. They seem to want to leave that out. Eh, it's not that big of a deal. I don't have to really live righteous. I don't have to be righteous in God's eyes. You know, live right according to what God tells me to do. You know, God's Jesus' righteousness is supposed to be imputed to us, and it is to those who are saved and born again. Can we still fall flat on our face? I've fallen flat on my face plenty of times as a Christian. I still struggle with sin. Right? And temptation. Uh, but the thing is, is the righteousness part is Jesus comes into your life and his righteousness is imputed to us and he starts telling you, don't do this, don't do that. And when you fall flat on your face, oh, didn't I just tell you not to do that? You get back up, you repent, you drop your cross, repent, forsake, get back to your walk with the Lord. Mm -hmm. so we talked about with those three things in, the Holy Ghost. Those are signs of someone who's saved. They're doing their best to live right, according to God's Word. They've got true peace, not fake peace. It's a whole other study to do to talk about the fake peace that people like to put on this big show that they have fake peace. Or people that like to get drunk and say, I'm, and it looks like they're, they're joyful, uh, they're drunk. Right? But it's in the Holy Ghost. Remember the seventh part of the armor of God, the saved sinner, with the Holy Ghost. You have to have the Holy Ghost. you got to be in Christ Jesus our Lord, and you have to have Jesus in you. The rest of the pieces of armor of God won't do squat if you don't have the Holy Ghost in you. If you're not one of His that we read about. 2 Corinthians 7.8 We'll end here for the intro. 2 Corinthians 7.8 For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Some people get sorry for a season. And then they go back to, you see the pride, and that repentance is no longer there. But verse 9, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, he's not rejoicing because you're, you're sad, but that you sorrow to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. Sorrows of the world worketh death. The law of sin and death. Okay? Uh, for the wages of sin is death. Verse 11, For behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. 
Repentance, true biblical repentance, as it applies to salvation and the, life, and the life of a Christian, it starts at salvation and continues the rest of your walk with the Lord. And how do we know that you repented at salvation? Verse 11, For behold, the selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, Yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves. There's that pesky word again, approved. Approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Once again, approved. I had to throw that in there, brothers and sisters of Christ. You have people out there, oh, you don't have to repent. Repentance is not part of the plan of salvation. You know, that's workspace. They've not approved themselves to be clear in this matter. They don't, they're not going to be putting on the whole, anybody has that attitude, they're not going to be putting on the whole armor of God. Okay? They're only going to be putting on the pieces they think look cool and, and they'll still live how they want to live and do what they want to do. So, as we go into this set of studies, keep asking yourself, how many people do we see out there today with Saul's armor on? The sorrows of the world that work at death. They have Saul's armor on. I was one of those false converts. I had Saul's armor on at one time. Okay. How many of us are going to have the actual armor of the Lord on? The armor of God. You know, like, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to make a, a, a complicated, but King David had certain things that God gave him and said, this is what I've given to you, it's proven. And that's what he used. But there's a lot of people today who still choose to put on Saul's armor. They still look like the world, act like the world, it's all about pleasing the world. It's all about sin to them, justifying sin, sin for a season. So, as we go through this armor of God, and we start going through all the different pieces, we're going to talk about all seven pieces. Okay. And uh, just remember, you have to put on the whole armor of God. And the second thing is, is the armor has to be proven. That's why the Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God. Study. To show that self, what's that word again? Approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. The heart. Perfect. Why do I say the heart? Because the Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. That the man may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Good works, works that aren't reprobate, worthless, works that aren't uh, false, they're bad works, trying to pose as good works. So that's going to be our intro to the armor of God. Hopefully I'll see you in these next studies. And I uh, want to go ahead and end it with uh, grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.